Hi everyone, welcome to another session of the ATP Innovation Week 2022. My name is Vinicio. I'm an ATP Applications Specialist here at Hyperbaric. And today we'll be providing an overview of the facts and myths of using HPP for fresh and raw pet food. As you can probably see already in my screen, my name, my affiliation that I'm in the USA office at Hyperbaric. And we shall get started with that with the HPP where, well, the raw pet food in general, it has been gaining lots of interest. It's one of the fastest growing industries uh, for, for the food industry. And in case of the HPP sector or industry is also the fastest growing segment. So we shall see plenty and plenty of uh, commercial applications and companies coming joining the market with the HPP in, in coming years. So this is thank you to the, thanks to the to the benefits of the raw diet, which are based well with uh, mussels, organ meats, mixed up with uh, veggies, uh, cereals, whatever the pet needs to meet the nutritional requirements. And some of the reported benefits, well, they have better oral health, more energy and excitement when mealtime comes over. Uh, again, weight management, they are also, uh, in terms of gastrointestinal benefits, less and less, uh, amount of feces, they are odorless or with less odor, and it also helps to uh, shine your uh, skin and, and coat. So just covering briefly that HUP is a non-thermal food processing technology. You use uh, cold water between 40 to 25 Fahrenheit, 4 to 25 Celsius at very, very high pressure, 6,000 bars, 87,000 PSI, which would be a equivalent of going six times at the deepest point of the ocean. 10 kilometers or 200,000 feet beneath the ocean, if that depth would actually exist, that's the amount of pressure we generate with, the, with our equipment to eliminate foodborne pathogens, extend shelf life, and it has no impact or minimal impact in terms of the nutrition and sensory characteristics of food. It's been available for years since the early 1990s for human consumption, lots and lots of different foods. For pet food, it's a relatively new segment or started in the 2010 approximately, uh, even before, but a few companies. But with this same reason, there's lots of uh, misinformation. There are lots of myths surrounding the HPP pet food processing. So today we're taking away the blindfold and uh, fighting these myths by presenting science facts. Uh, at the very end, well, we hope that you decide to join the HPP family if it's not, unfortunately, not the case, at least you are doing this with uh, inform, in, a, in an informed decision based on, on science facts. So we shall get started. Just a little bit overview of the agenda for today with uh, safety and regulations, myths and facts, probiotics and nutrition in general with some concluding or, or closing remarks. So safety of raw food, food diets, our first myth. Absence of pathogens, uh, trials indicates the product is safe to consume. It's a, a myth. The fact is that you do need the control measures. You're fighting, uh, well, these uh, pathogens are microorganisms, implying that you cannot see it with your bare eye. So it's hard to fight uh, uh, an enemy that you cannot actually see. And by any chance uh, or small samples, you may actually test for the absence of pathogens, but in a bigger, as the batches get bigger, it is harder to take a, a representative amount of samples, will cost money. And at the very end, again, it's uh, dangerous. We can, it can lead to uh, life-threatening conditions in some times. So in this case, we have uh, the image of here, here from the website of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the, the CDC. Keeping pets healthy, they actually uh, place a large, large list of all uh, pathogens, not only foodborne, but other pathogens that, as well that can uh, present a risk for you and your family. And over here, it's actually taken from their website, but sometimes carry germs that can make people sick. So for foodborne transmission, even pets can get uh, sick too. They are more resistant than humans, but they can get sick too, do not forget that. But transmission from pet to human can occur directly. Well, if you, you're in touch with a feces, with the saliva, when the pets are giving up uh, some love, if you mishandle by improper storage, if you forget the, the, the raw pet formulation outside the fridge without any processing, that can lead to bacteria growth. 
And if you actually prepare this in your kitchen, you actually, it's actually recommended to have a, a separate uh, uh, utensils, uh, cutting boards, knives. We probably do it in, in other places that are not used to prepare uh, consumption of human foods or at least clean thoroughly afterwards. So these are three different ways in which you can get sick through foodborne pathogens while preparing or uh, raw pet food. And well, there are plenty of pathogens. In this case, we are focusing on three of the most uh, uh, dangerous bacteria because they have high incidence. And, and again, they're present basically year after year. In particular, we'll be taking a look on the report, Foodborne Outbreak for Human Consumption 2016 by the CDC. And on the screen, you can see some microscopic images of Salmonella E. coli or the Shiga toxin E. coli and Listeria monocytogenes. Uh, we start with an overview, as in anything, children, pregnant women, the elder are the most susceptible, the most in danger when uh, foodborne uh, pathogens may be present in the food. And you can see a little bit of the, of the breakdown of that report that, uh, well, uh, Listeria uh, is, uh, attacks uh, aggressively to people, to the elder, E. coli, Salmonella, they don't differ and regardless of age or, or sex that uh, they can be present um, in foods. And you can see over here, the median age of infection or illness developed was 32 and 20 years. So even though that uh, you are in a uh, young or adult young, that you can still get sick with uh, foodborne pathogens. So we follow now up with, uh, with meat products and you can see just two outbreaks reported for salmonella, but you can see the numbers, 130 people, 134 people that got infected. 22 were hospitalized for raw beef. Well, this was a relatively small outbreaks. Only 11 people got sick, but you can see seven were actually hospitalized. Again, it uh, really brings up the risk of being infected with uh, any of these pathogens. Uh, so more data over here, you can see that 3,000 cases or slightly over 3,000 cases for Salmonella, which is the one with the most incidences followed by the E. coli and Listeria, 300, 100 approximately. Out of the 3,000, 25% were hospitalized. It starts to grow with the E. coli, and you can see for Listeria monocytogenes, 100% hospitalizations, nearly 20% of people unfortunately died because of infection of, uh, with Listeria. So it's a very, very high mortality rate and a very, very high risk. So again, it's a myth. You do need additional controlled measures to, to minimize risk associated with foodborne pathogens. Next section, meats and fats with regulation mandates. The myth that FDA uh, mandates the use of HPV for the food, pet food uh, industry for pet food safety. And the fact is uh, HPV is only uh, an option. So there are other alternatives, other processing intervention methods but HPP is highly regarded because of the versatility, the ease of use for processors, and of course for consumers, or in this case, the, the pets, the improved quality in terms of the nutritional and sensory properties of foods. So over here, this guidance document is free to download, but it uh, has been prepared by FDA. And in one of the sections, section four, if I don't uh, uh, remember that, uh, but, but uh, they over here enlist the uh, recommendations for using HPP. That HPP is a uh, plan to minimize risk with uh, bacteria, the three after mentioned uh, uh, bacteria, Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli, parasites such as Toxoplasma gondii. In terms of uh, bacteria, well, HPP also has some limitations. So HPP does not eliminate bacterial spores such as or pathogens, Clostridium perfrigens may be uh, present in meats. Prostrium botulinum, Bacillus cereus, also sometimes in meats, but also in other uh, type of ingredients such as uh, fruits or, or vegetables. So they can survive HPP, but so you need additional control measures. The other important recommendations here by FDA that's uh, so far there's no consensus in terms of the formulation uh, factors, HPP conditions that uh, yield a safe harbor, implying that, well, Every product you're taking into the market must go through a validation study. So if you're planning for a 45, and 90 day, 60 day shelf life, whatever, you need to sample up to that date. So make sure to plan accordingly when launching a, a product with HPP. 
over here in the image, well, just uh, to see what happens to the bad guys, you can see on the left, the uh, cells of E. coli mm, at the shape of a, of a sausage before the HPP. After the HPP, you can see that uh, wrinkles are all around. Uh, there's uh, some missing parts. It's like basically breaking a balloon. You break out the balloon and then it frees up all the machinery that the pathogen needs to grow, uh, to move around, to reproduce. So uh, the greater the pressure level, the more the damage. And again, the, it leads to inactivation of pathogens and safe foods. Here we'll just a uh, summary, a very, very brief summary of uh, conditions used to uh, induce a five log reduction, which is the requirement by FDA or eliminate 100,000 cells of uh, pathogens. In this particular case for uh, salmonella in chicken, well, uh, beef, pork, and pork organs. We have plenty of information in case that you are interested and you can use this as a starting point. But usually you process at 6,000 bars, equivalent to 87,000 PSI, holding time between three to six uh, minutes. So some of these uh, results are actually in agreement with uh, some of the latest research advances presented by the University of uh, Nebraska, where the food processing center, it's uh, one of our best customers. They have an, uh, a hyperbaric 55 liter unit for, for product development, for testing. And again, they have been heavily involved in recent years for in the pet food industry. So they found out that applying Slightly below the 6,000 bars or the 87,000 PSI with a three minute holding time uh, allows to induce a five log reduction of uh, salmonella. They also noted that formulation has an influence. So as you start to increase the fat content or between uh, 10 to 20% of fat content, HP start uh, to become uh, less effective eliminating uh, microorganisms such as salmonella, which happens uh, in any other source of foods. And we also evaluated the effect of uh, acclimations, acclimatation. Uh, it does, it's not the same to leave the pathogens to stay for 24 hours and 72 hours in refrigeration. So the longer they, stay, they remain in the food, the more comfortable they feel and the harder it is they to take a run. Like you just get into a new city, the more time you spend in this uh, new city, the harder it will be for you to eventually move to, uh, to other place. So this is all the recordings that were part of our HP Innovation Week uh, last year. They're all available in our YouTube channel or through our website in case that you, you want to see more information on this topic. Uh, the versatility, again, of the HPP technology. So can you apply it for uh, fresh foods in, that are either uh, refrigerated or frozen? So again, you have the blends of muscle meat, organs, veggies, fruits, cereals, sometimes dairy, etc. You place them into pouches and again, you sell them refrigerated or frozen. It can also be used as a pre-step before freeze drying because well, some of these uh, pathogen, the bacteria may survive the freeze drying step. So we use the, uh, you apply HPP before the, the freeze drying and we will actually walk you through in, in a couple of uh, slides. But first, here are some commercial examples of the of the blended uh, meats with the other ingredients. You can actually also do some meaty bones, the wings, the necks, the carcasses to reduce risk uh, with foodborne pathogens. Again, it's available for dogs, for, for cats. Uh, uh, it's not only the usual beef, chicken, pork. You also have uh, an example, sam uh, salmon, lamb, different, different flavors and most of them are designed by nutritionists or, or veterinarians that know about uh, pet nutrition to, to meet their requirements. So here is now, the this is part of a, a fantastic video that our marketing team placed up. We have actually the owner, CEO of uh, Steve's Real Food, along with our marketing specialist, uh, Anthony, one of the uh, brilliant minds behind this uh, and many other uh, events. But well, first, uh, the process over here starts when you have the, the chops, over there in the plastic packaging, you can see that they're actually quite uh, large chops. These are placed into baskets that carry over the chops into the HPP unit for, for processing. Afterwards, the chops are taken in into an uh, ultra clean room uh, to make sure that well, all surfaces clean, minimize recontamination risk. They take them out of the, 
of the of the plastic pouches, and then they take it over to a grinder where afterwards they form them into into kibbles and patties, which is the the preferred or one of the most popular presentation by by pet parents because it's easier to to handle. Once it's in the final shape. It's being placed into the freeze dryer units, which over here you can see that they are actually like uh, like ovens. And afterwards, they are ready to to bring them over to the final packaging, where we are glad to have a uh, Tanpu as uh, our partners because well, it's really hard to develop uh, packaging that's 100% recyclable materials. In this case, Tanpu developed a, a polyethylene-based uh, pouch multi-layer that, uh, that, uh, that allows 100% recyclability without compromising other properties such as mechanical properties, such as the gas barrier properties. So again, we are glad to have them as partners and it's one of the suppliers for both Seed Real Food and Kiwi Kitchens, which you saw just saw a couple of slides ago. For probiotics, uh, the myth that HPP eliminates the bad, but also the good bacteria. Fact is, is that uh, some uh, you can actually sometimes reduce the content of uh, of, uh, of these beneficial bacteria, but they are also quite sturdy to HPP conditions, so they may eventually survive or recover through through storage. In fact, well, lactic acid bacteria, which is one of the main pro probiotics, they are being sought in Europe too as a way to eliminate. Uh, nitrates, nitrates in, in well, sliced deli meats, sausages, etc. So to force, to control spore former pathogens such as Clostridium perfrigens, Clostridium botulinum. Hyperbaric actually is participating with uh, some European research institutions to, to, for, for this project. And you can see over here some of the, of the briefings of the project, more than 60 different uh, types of lactic acid bacteria. They found one that was actually very pressure resistant and that can eventually outgrow any of the pathogens during storage. So uh, yes, you can sometimes reduce the, the content, but they may recover or survive. Uh, it all depends on the formulation and apply the HPP conditions. The best either way is just the spore forming probiotics. You think about a bacterial spore as a war bunker, uh, they hide in this war bunker to survive adverse conditions, including HPP. So again, 100% survival after the process, uh, at least uh, for conditions currently used by the industry, which would be up to 87,000 PSI, 6,000 bars and ambient temperature. And well, Bacillus coagulans is one of the most popular probiotics, not only for pet food, but also for human foods as well. Now the most uh, lengthy sanction, but also the, one of the most uh, important and were most, uh, there are lots of myths related to the nutrition and HPP pet food. This is mainly because, well, HPP induces color change in raw muscles. So of course that uh, pet parents, veterinarians are worried about whether these color changes will affect or take away the, the nutrients. But the fact is that uh, again, you can have the color change, but uh, the nutritional content, the sensory properties will be basically the same before and after the HPP process. So we start, uh, again, this is the deepest part of, uh, of the presentation. So take a moment and feel comfortable. Uh, we start with a very, a very general overview of uh, uh, effects of HPP on nutritional compounds with an emphasis of meats before going into the pet food portion. So we start with a very the technical answer would be that HP does not affect the covalent bones, which is the backbone of the molecules that make up uh, well vitamins uh, or other other nutrients, other chemical compounds that give the sensory properties to food. But with a very easy analogy, it uh, will make it the, a better understanding. So imagine you just uh, jump into the into the subway in New York City, in the first station at peak hour. Uh, so you will be just sitting around and uh, with uh, water uh, uh, surrounding, which will be the case of vitamins and other compounds that, that are present in the foods. As you, the subway starts to, to travel to, through the stations, more people get in. Likewise, well, when you start to raise pressure, water comes closer together, they are more tightly packed. There is no way to move around, but well, you basically see the smiley face, you will still remain safe. 
And by the end of the, the last station, when you get off, you get back to your original space or state. And the same again thing happens to, to molecules under HPP. And sorry, that's what I just uh, said. And again, when you jump off the last station, you just return to your ori original state. For the proteins and larger molecules, we start uh, a little bit, bit with a technical uh, background very briefly before we jump into another analogy. So the first, uh, we analyze the, the structure of the proteins where primary structure, you can see the sequence of amino acids, the molecules, that blue block, the red block, the yellow block, in whatever order they need to be. For well, these uh, molecules, these building blocks are what provide the nutritional content. This is what you need to, to thrive and, and be healthy. So the blue block with the red block will be joined by covalent bonds. And if you remember on a couple of last slides, HPP does not eliminate uh, uh, or alter the covalent bond. So the amino acid will basically remain uh, stuck together. Secondary structure, well, you have a chains or strands of, pro of, of, of amino acid sequences that go either in parallel sheets or interwinding in a helix as shown over here on the, on the image. On the left, we have the sheets. Over here, we have the helixes. You can see that uh, they are face-to-face -face, or in this case, uh, almost face-to-face, -face, but uh, it's a short distance between these spaces. So there's opportunity to interactions through hydrogen bonds, which is oxygen with hydrogen binding together. So you have a couple of these or lots of these, it makes actually pretty, uh, makes them pretty sturdy. And to this point, HPV does not uh, make uh, major changes or usually does not make major changes. Tertiary structure, well, it would be just too boring if these strands or helixes go straight through space. So they start twisting around as shown over here in the, on the image. And you can see that there are void spaces. There are also larger distances between portions of the, of the protein that we can actually bind. So there's uh, lesser interactions. They may be weaker, easier to, to move around. And finally, well, all of this makes a, a protein subunit and the quaternary uh, structure will be one large subunit with another large subunit binded together. And the same thing, it's uh, lesser interactions, weaker interactions. So you overall, by the larger the structure, the easier it is to, to move around. And again, you do, it's not completely enclosed. They have both void spaces all over the, the structure. So with HPP, we get back to our easy analogy. In this case, uh, the subway, but this time you are not by yourself. You jump with a group of friends into the first, uh, uh, into the first station and you are just sitting over there as in, uh, in a circle. You are standing up in a circle. So people may get around, but if you and your friends are mean and very, very strong, you will not be pushed around and uh, if uh, you don't want to see the space to other people. So you may still be uh, placed within the circle, even though the, the wagon is completely crowded. So again, the stronger molecules, an example, well, some proteins, enzymes, some fiber or the fiber that have again plenty and plenty of numerous interactions, millions if not billions, that keep them to uh, strung together. And basically, with HPP, they will not be moved around. Other proteins, well, they may not be as strong or do not have the uh, such a large number of interactions. But well, you can see it's the same amount of the same amount of people, smiley faces. But rather than sitting in a circle, they are just facing or standing face to face in two lines. Same thing with the proteins. Remember that they are not completely enclosed. Void spaces where water, when you raise pressure, can actually get, push them in between and maybe in just a very uh, general example, open up the structure. But overall, it's the same sequence of amino acids, it's the same nutritional value, uh, again, just like the subway. Same amount, same amount of people, just in a different arrangement. So with this, uh, similar to what happens to the myoglobin or the protein that uh, that gives the red color in meat, and that's why you perceive that the color change. So you can see that uh, around the 150 megapascals, which is uh, slightly uh, over 20,000 psi, 30,000 psi, you can see that the color change starts to be quite uh, noticeable. It also depends on the amount of myoglobin, so the change is more 
perceivable in beef when compared to chicken or, or turkey. So this is what happens with the myoglobin. You open the structure and there's a portion of uh, myoglobin that has iron. You, well, I, iron can be, you can recall any bridges that are out there in the outside that eventually they start to turn brown. That's because they get in, in touch with oxygen. So same thing with over here, you open the structure of the myoglobin, it gets in touch with the oxygen that's within the foods and that's when you have the, the brown color, but otherwise, again, the nutritional profile in terms of the protein, amino acids is not altered at all. But uh, why do we know that it's oxygen? Because well, over here in another experiment about the University of Nebraska, in this case, they have thicker cuts, not mean that is uh, blended or when you blend it or mince it, you can get oxygen within the mixture. But here you have thick cuts that are seared to prevent any oxygen migration. And you can see that after HP, it retains the same color. So again, it's uh, a matter of oxygen getting in touch with the myoglobin. You can actually stabilize this part of uh, the myoglobin in order to retain the color through, well, through gases, through chemical compounds, or even adding some uh, colorants derived from natural ingredients. So again, there are some ways to, to try to improve this. So for cooked or cured products, the color change is not noticeable. And a great example, well, all the slice deli meats that you can see on the market, uh, apple gate uh, reduce salt, uh, enhance safety with HPP, but color is remains the same. Same thing with over high, very high quality premium products such as dry cured ham, salami, etc. So now that we have uh, the background, and again, they, uh, nothing will happen with a nutritional compounds, we jump into the portion of HPP pet food nutrition. First, you can see you know, the chemical or the physical chemical properties of uh, raw beef, fat, protein, carbohydrates, it's basically the same before and after the HPP. It's also demonstrated with a case study by Steve's Real Food. So it was a very compromised uh, uh, company in terms of pet food nutrition. They were actually uh, somewhat reluctant at the beginning to use HPP because of the color change. Can it uh, actually be detrimental to the nutritional compounds? So rather than just uh, hearing the, the guy over here trying to sell you a machine, they took hands into their own matter and they actually performed their own in-house study. So they monitored, I don't know, over 90 different um, nutritional compounds including over here, you can see a list of some of the amino acids, lysine, leucine, isolicine, histidine, arginine. You can see over here on the, on the bottom axis that it goes from minus one to plus one. So it's basically negligible changes in terms of could be associated to variability, to instrumental or human error for practical purposes is before the, the same concentration before and after the HP. So it was uh, actually 91 of 95 compounds. Other four compounds do the, 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 uh, display the major changes, which can be also related to the chemistry of the formulation, but well, they adjusted, they added some more ingredients in order to counteract uh, this loss and still meet the, the nutritional requirements. So it's not perfect, but it's very close to, to perfect as you can see. And again, it's a, 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 an industry or real case application or, or study. Next, we have the clinical studies that have been recently published by a university in, in Europe, divided into three different parts, the biochemical organoelectric assessments, the before feeding this to, to two dogs, uh, measured bl blood indicators and indicators of uh, digestive health. Here are the references in case that you want to take a, a, a photo of the, or a screenshot of uh, uh, to cite them. Either way, we can provide them anytime if you reach out to us. So getting started with the first part, the biochemical assessment. They uh, tried out the effects of HPP in three different formulations. You can see the ingredients over here. Veal, chicken byproducts, which can be tendons, uh, an example, spinach, apple. Uh, same thing here. They just changed the protein base, but it's, uh, again, has different uh, ingredients that can be used to to meet the nutritional requirements of, of the pets. So over here processing at the standard HPP conditions, 87,000 PSI, 6,000 bars. 
for three minutes, it did not alter any of the properties. And what we just uh, saw in general for beef, over here when the, uh, the muscle or the meat is combined with other ingredients, it's the same before and after the HFP. Open bars correspond to the unprocessed samples. Closed or color bars corresponds to those that have been processed with the HPP for diet number one, diet number two, and diet number three. And again, same protein contents, practically the same fat content, carbohydrates, and again, it's uh, no major changes. In terms of the sensory properties, well, the researchers were not uh, very or trying this in terms of the of the taste, but they do evaluate the the appearance. Some of the of the muscles or by incorporating the organ meat, they do not have such a red color, but a, a paler, pale, pale gray. So color changes were not uh, as noticeable uh, as, as shown over here, but in the other in the other uh, uh, characteristics, you see that uh, they reported no changes, no changes, no changes, consistency, smell, appearance, before and after, and this uh, applied for the, the three different formulations. Part two of the study, that's where we get the, the volunteers, in this case, 20 people, dogs, and male and female that are considered healthy adults with this age and, and weight. And before starting the, the study, they were actually, <coughs> I'm sorry, they were actually fed with low quality, uh, with low quality dry pet food. And that's the way they, they reported in the study. So again, they, they were being fed uh, low quality foods, they then, then they start feeding their HPP chicken based diet through 45 days with blood samples taken after 15 days and at day 45 and well, at the beginning of the, of the study, of course. So over here you can see uh, the blood color or the, the content of total protein albumin in, uh, in the blood. It's for albumin, it's uh, basically no changes. For the total protein content, you can see that uh, it uh, not only start to increase as uh, as uh, researchers keep feeding the, the bulldogs with a raw chicken diet. So you have an increase in blood protein content. At the same time, outstandingly well, you can see that uh, the amount of cholesterol present in, present in the blood reduced also by by uh, twenty percent after forty five days of of the of storage. Because well, this is a concern. You're feeding them more protein, more fats. So how does this affect the, the health of, of the pet? So over here, uh, well, I did not present the results, but they reported that uh, there were no changes in other indicators such as red or white blood cells, because sometimes the increase in protein content on the blood may be a sign of kidney or, or, or liver failure. So again, the, the dogs remain healthy according to these uh, blood indicators. And the conclusions by the, by the author over here that it was a short uh, feeding period, but you can see a positive and very notable effect when feeding the raw HPP chicken formulation, uh, both for in terms of protein and lipid uh, metabolism. So again, it's a small study, but with very promising results and shows that uh, HPP does not alter the nutritional uh, conditions of, of foods. Third part of the study, they, they, now we have a reduced number of uh, participants, only 10 pit food dogs. You can see over here, uh, place close attention, but a dry x-ray diet consisted of 300 grams of dry food. At the start of the study, they start feeding 500 grams. Um, so it's a more amount and, well, they basically monitored fecal samples at day zero, 15 and 45. So again, you can see that uh, over here, despite the HPP is 500 grams, 300 grams, the amount of dry matter or thing or or parts that are not as nutritious to to pets is way below when compared to to the to the conventional diet. Over here on the on the left side, you can see the axis, the the bars, uh, in terms of the raw raw numbers, the raw amount. And over here on the right side, you can see the amount of the corresponding percentage in the formulation. So the HPP had a uh, nearly 45% weight in, in the formulation compared to only 15 or 20% of the dry food. Same thing or very similar values for the fat. Uh, 250 grams, five times the amount of protein that you are providing in the raw HPP chicken diet when compared to the dry extruded food. 
And the same thing happens over here with the, with the fat, but remember that uh, the, the previous portion, no, it has, it does, did not display any adverse health effects. Um, now we see the fecal output. You can see over here in this table at the beginning of the study. Well, first that digestibility, it's the amount of uh, food you provide. You take away the feces and divide by the intake. So that's the percentage of food that it's been retained by the organism or by the body. So at the beginning of the, of the study, you can see 300 grams of the dry food, 130 or close to 130 uh, in terms of the amount of feces, which is a uh, 57% uh, digestibility. And you can see this is very, very notable results. Uh, you start to reduce uh, by three times, by six times at the end of the study, only 21 grams of feces or 95% uh, digestibility. And remember that you were feeding nearly five times the amount of uh, protein with a raw HP diet. Well, over here at the end, from 250 grams, they are only excreting or shedding away five grams of protein in, in the feces when compared to 35 in, in the case of, uh, of the raw diets. So that same thing applies over here for the fat and other nutritional compounds of interest. Again, it's a very small study, but you cannot actually just ignore this uh, notable and actually outstanding uh, results. So certainly more studies are needed in order to understand the benefits of the, of the raw diets, the, uh, the HPP diets. But in this case, I will also recommend to consult your veterinarian to, to, to know what, what are the recipes that will meet the nutritional requirements of, of your pets. So with all, we are approaching the end of the presentation or closing remarks. Myth that HP is a perfect technology for human and pet nutrition. The fact is that uh, it's very versatile, but it's not perfect. And again, it's still your best alternative due through the ease of use, the versatility, and of course the benefits for the pet parents and most importantly for, for the pets. Foods that are safe to consume, extend the shelf life, without compromising the nutritional or sensory quality. This is well the testimony of the CEO, uh, Nicole Linsley uh, of, of Steve's Real Food, that uh, well describing that uh, when they got hands into the matter, decided to jump into the HPP, that it was not uh, seamlessly, that you need to well perform, they perform their own studies, they figure out uh, different ways on how to incorporate the HPP operation within your whole production line but again took uh, more than two years but uh, easy or the right things are not easy and that's her testimony again part of the video we saw or the a video the, the images of the video we saw early in case that you wanna wanna see it myth uh, hyperbaric is the leading hp equipment supplier you know what some myths are actually based on true facts and that's where we our legends are born so HPP or Hyperbaric is the leader of uh, HPP equipment supplier, more than 60% of the units installed around the world, which in numbers is more than 350 industrial units. So in different countries all over the place, we know what we do. We like to, uh, we always love to guide customers through, through this path to make it more easily. And again, we will join, the, if you allow us, uh, we will join your journey on the HPP world. So in my case, uh, my department, the HP application, where we provide a free technical service for customers, potential buyers, basically anyone who's curious about the HP technology, feel free to reach out for uh, or questions related to food processing, packaging, regulations, uh, trials, of course, that I am uh, based here in the USA in our Miami office, but I also have the uh, support or the, in contact with my colleagues over there in Spain, Mario Gonzalez Riqueros and our director, Carol Tonello. Please feel free to visit our website. We have plenty of resources over here. If you go HP technology resources, uh, recordings of uh, the HP Innovation Week 2022 will be available on demand uh, soon. We have the, the recordings of the last year's past webinar recordings blogs that we keep, entries that we uh, keep updating every month, flyers with paper, white papers, case studies. So again, lots and lots of materials. You are welcome anytime to make trials 
free of charge with us in our headquarters at Spain or office here in, in Miami, Florida. And here is the contact information, uh, any questions that you may have, and I will be, feel free to reach out and please, uh, please call us. Thank you for your attention. And again, anytime that questions arise, feel free to, to, to contact us.